This podcast is brought to you by Shorts TV and is not affiliated with the Oscars or the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences in any way. Hello and welcome. You're listening to the Shorts TV podcast. I'm Carter Pilcher and I'm joined as always by the brilliant Rasha Goel. Thank you, Carter. It's great to be back again. How are you doing? I'm doing great and really looking forward to our next interview with the filmmaking team behind the documentary Colette, director Anthony Giacchino and producer Alice Dillard. Me too. And for those that are listening, Colette tells the story of 90-year-old Colette Marin Catherine, who confronts her past by visiting the German concentration camp where her brother was killed. As a young girl, she fought Hitler's Nazis as a member of the French resistance, but for 74 years, she has refused to step foot in Germany. All that changes when a young history student named Lucy enters her life. Je pense que c'est ça. Alors, Lucy, c'est vous? Oui. Avanti. Bonjour, ma petite fille. <laughs> Allez, on y va. <laughs> Pas trop fatigué? Non, ça va. Bon, alors, un, avanti. Voulez-vous un café? Non, merci. C'est sûr? Oui. Anthony and Alice, great to have you with us today. Thank you for joining us. Congratulations on your nomination. What a great, great honor. It's a great film. Yeah, thank you very much. We're happy to be here. Very happy. Thank you. And and just for our audience, tell us where you are. You're you don't look like you're in the same place. No, uh, I'm in Brooklyn, New York. And I'm in London. Um, even though part of my heart is in Paris, but today I'm in London. <laughs> oh. <laughs> this has been our default for the past year. The last time Elise and I saw each other was in Missoula, Montana at the Big Sky Documentary Film Festival. Wow. Uh, in February of 2020. Oh, wow. Um, and then when we went back, it sort of, you know, everything fell apart. Um, so we've been doing these interviews like this, but uh, it looks like we'll be reunited in Los Angeles uh, yeah. in a couple of weeks. Oh, fantastic. And for a great, great event. Um, before we continue to, could both of you just say a little bit about yourself and your titles in regards to this film? Yeah, so I, I'm, I'm the, the director of the film, uh, Colette. The, one of the interesting things about this film is uh, that I don't speak French. Um, and I will now always say I am grateful. I will for, forever be grateful that I don't speak French because that's sort of how I found Elise. You know, as a filmmaker and a, a director and a producer working in France, I needed somebody to sort of show me around uh, Normandy. This is before we even knew who Colette was. Uh, Elise and I met on this, ended up meeting on this project. What is nice with Anthony is that he has a passion to uh, uh, document his story. And I have a passion to hold my mic to people who have a strong story to say and who have emotions to, to share. The working together with, uh, with Anthony has made uh, this film. Well, I, ha I have to say, you guys sure found somebody interesting in Colette. Yes. It's, it's an amazing and fascinating documentary. How did you find her? She was, yes, just sort of a, a regular person. Right. Right. Um, she, she was, you know, she lives in an apartment by herself in Cannes, you know, and, and, and so, so yeah, uh, it was as simple as a tour guide. We, at least, and I were talking with the tour guide just about uh, Normandy and the beaches of Normandy. And he said, oh, you know, I know someone um, named uh, Colette who was in the French resistance. You know, I could introduce you. So um, in a way, it was kind of like that. We didn't know anything about her. He had just said, you know, I, I can make this introduction if you want. And that's 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 how it happened. Wow. You know, um, I mean, we were looking for stories of World War Two and what an amazing one we ended up uh, finding. Uh, Colette, she had very vivid memory of the war. So it was when we met her, we were impressed by how uh, how, how much passion she conveyed. Uh, and rea rea realism, she conveyed uh, memories of the war. It was as if we were there. So, of course, we were uh, grabbed. Uh, a 90 year old, uh, strong woman, very brave. And she had been a, a fighter also all her, her life. And that seduced us, Anthony and me. We thought, wow, this woman deserves 
to tell her story. Uh, she has a, a message to transmit. And as much as she seduced us, we thought she would, she's going to, to, to seduce the world. But how did Lucy come on board? Like Anthony has children, I have children. And we had, we had this idea that uh, our audience would be young people. Mm. So we, we researched the story of Jean-Pierre and we tried to find someone who could accompany her uh, and us to the camp of Dora. Because uh, Anthony had this idea that he knew Dora and he thought, okay, maybe that's a good idea. Uh, to take uh, Colette there. But this story needed to make sense to Colette. And uh, we wanted to, uh, to appeal to our young audience. And this is how, doing some research, we, we, we found uh, Lucy as a young aspiring historian working on, uh, on biographies of uh, French deportees to Dora. And uh, we introduced them to each other in front of the camera. And it worked. Magic happened in this story. Yeah. And 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 a, th a thing that I, I like to point out about about Lucy is um, that she was 17 years old when we filmed that. Wow, so she's 19 now. So so she was 17, the exact same age that Jean Pierre was when he was arrested by the Gestapo. Oh wow! Because it really made real that age, and it made you think that Jean Pierre. I couldn't believe that that's how young he was. When he was involved in this, yeah. right, and and that would have made also Colette even younger, you know, three years younger than that. So it was a constant reminder of their youth, of Colette and Jean Pierre's youth, by having Lucy there. You know, for me, it was very uh, energizing, sort of on that level as well. When you make a film like this, it's a very sensitive issue. It's a very sensitive topic, and you know, we have to be so mindful of Colette's feelings. Like. She is strong and stoic in some moments, but in other moments you see that vulnerability. So how did you work around how much she wanted to share and then just being sensitive to who this 90-something-year-old woman was, right? And making sure that yeah. you respected her feelings, yet were able to tell this compelling story. It's a great question because it was really the central question on the production. We know that this is going to be a difficult journey. I don't know if we were ready for the level of emotion that we experienced. I mean, we, we figured, you know, because she didn't want to go, it was clear that there would be some sort of uh, difficulty with this. But we also understood that we had to take care of Colette on this journey. And that was something that, that Elise was very mindful of and sort of made clear to the whole crew. Colette had said afterwards that she felt as though she were in a nest sort of on that whole time that she was was protected because, it, and it's, it's especially like the moment where she realizes that she didn't bring flowers for her, you know, it kind of like right there, like everything like really breaks, right? Yeah. Uh, for her and, and, and for Lucy. So, you know, we were not going, if she didn't want to do something, we wouldn't do it, which is sort of borne out in that scene with the mayor, for example, when right. she just said, stop, yeah. like we stopped. And it was very clear. We had a big plan with that, right, Elise? I mean, when, as, as the, the, the way we, that we would work. Yes, if we, if we go back, it's interesting because if we go back to the very beginning, in fact, before even we, we talked to Colette about going to the camp, we had a long conversation and let the, the trust grow between us so that she knew that we were working in honesty and with very much respect. And we had created this bond before and that lasts till now. So during the filming, um, once this is set up, you are in, a, in an environment where uh, people feel comfortable. And, yeah. um, and Colette was there to share with us what was going through her, herself. Mm. And so this allowed, for example, our director of photography, uh, Rose Bush, to come very close to, to Colette when she, uh, as Anthony was mentioning, the, 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 the scene of the flower. She could come very close to Colette because Colette was in this environment of trust and this nest. Uh, and if I may say, I mean, my colleague uh, Annie Small played a big role, a uh, producer as well, played a big, big role uh, in, into uh, creating this atmosphere of, of uh, protection around Colette and around Lucy. Because Lucy was 17, yeah, and she was she she needed also extra care. For example, I um, I helped Lucy to to navigate through the the camp before she would show 
the camp to to collect. We we empowered Lucy so that she felt not totally overwhelmed at what happened, although it was overwhelming for everybody. Regarde d'ailleurs toi. Allez, on y va. Va parce qu'on va pas rester là huit jours. Merci pas plus. Part of the charm of the film is the relationship between the two ladies. And, and as you said, Anthony, they, they didn't even know each other before they met. Did you see that happening, that relationship developing? Did you expect it? We talked about this a lot. It was sort of became a central theme for the filmmakers. You know, as we were discovering this is that we, you know, we realized that Colette is this um, individual who has a difficult relationship with the past, right? And in fact, right. wants to forget it so she can just survive and move on. Lucy, on the other hand, is this person who wants to remember the past so she can move on and sort of not, you know, uh, make mistakes of, of what happened in the past. So you have this really interesting tension between wanting to forget and wanting to remember. Interesting. I fall on the wanting to remember side and I think Lucy wins out in that in that argument in the film and I think Colette even admits at the end yes right that that she sort of like when they're when they're sitting down she sort of understands the value of having continued this story well based on that Anthony then I think it's a perfect time to ask you and Elise how do you think this film then speaks to contemporary times because we are yeah going through a lot right now across the globe and here just in the United States so I'd love to get your take uh but from both of you what I can say, you said, uh, Rasha, we are all over the planet. And uh, this uh, film, the team was um, made of uh, people from different nationalities. And we came and made a film about Colette, who decided uh, when she was a young uh, girl to join the, the resistance against uh, Nazism, against fascism. During the film, we see Colette and Lucy joining forces to... Uh, revisit or to, to revisit the, 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 the past and try to make sense of it. Mm. And all this to say that um, I think it's really relevant, it resonates today as a film about solidarity, yeah. about the strengths we can gain by joining actions, united collective actions against a global threat. We are currently facing a threat that are... Uh, touching all around the planet. And so we, we're talking about how joining forces to combat. Yeah, and, and I, I would add to that, you know, just the, the, the question of um, coming to a consensus on what the past means, whether that, you know, I'd be as, as, a, as a country. I mean, we are all of us, I mean, in the United States, everywhere, even just our own past, you know, we are dealing with our true reckoning in this country. And I, and I, and I think that, I think that, that this film also kind of speaks to that, you know, in a way of not being afraid to kind of peer back and, and look and see what um, what happened, agree on the facts of what happened, and then move forward. And I do hope that people could see, could see that reflected in, in this film as well. So Anthony, what filmmaking techniques did you use when you were making Colette? It was clear that we wanted to do sort of a verite look at this, right? Now, in, in, even in all of the sort of verite, there is some form of setup, right? And, and the setup, the conceit is, okay, a woman who's never gone to Germany before, who was in the French resistance, is now gonna go for the first time to see the spot where her brother died. Mm -hmm. We want it to be observational within, the, within this kind of journey that we helped, basically, we kind of like pushed the train. Right. Right. And it was just like, OK, let's see what let's let's see what happened. You know, we, we were not going to be overbearing. We didn't want to be included in the film ourselves, which which was which was a very, I would say, intentional uh, choice. Yeah. Right. Um, I didn't see any room for us in the film. We wanted to, as Elise has been saying, like give voice to, to both of them. I hope we were successful in, 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 in doing that. And I, I feel that we we created the trust as you know, to allow them to be honest. I mean, like that was really, that was just the idea. Let's bring these generations together. The other thing that you did that made us audience members feel very 
much that this was real, you know, very, very, just that kind of feeling of I'm, I'm there is there were lots of very close, uh, at least mentioned it earlier, but there were lots of very close up shots. We got, we stayed with the two ladies primarily. Uh, you know, there's this, that lovely scene on the train when they, she goes into Germany and she like tries to stop herself from seeing it. She just can't bear the thought that it's happened. And, and you're close enough that you get, that you feel like you're seeing, you're sitting across from her. It's a, it's fabulous. So can you just talk about that? How, at least maybe how you did that, how your, your DOP got close like that, how you used, came up with those, those shots to create that feeling. It was beautiful. Yeah, I mean, but, but I, I would say that this this was because they were they felt in the trust bubble, Colette and you see, they allowed us to be very close to them and to uh, to feel in an organic movement. The reason we could also do this, and you could, I think, feel, was that we also uh, made a, an intentional decision to, and this might sound crazy, but we ate together every night, like when the camera was off and it was done we kind of continued. Colette has a, a, a photograph of all of us in her apartment now, and I, and I saw a picture of it, um, and I told her, I said, oh, I'm so happy to see that you have that picture of everyone in your, in your apartment. And she wrote back to me, and she said, that's become a family photo for me. That's fantastic. And I think that, yeah, and I think that that kind of gives you a sense of how we were um, you know, as, as a team. And I think that that allowed Rose to just get as close as she needed to get. You cannot really uh, overstate how important that was. What's interesting about your documentary too is that there's a healing component to it. So the fact that you all, you know, ate together, hung out together, but by the time you get to the end of the documentary, I think what's so beautiful is the fact that you have this woman who you've helped tell her story, but essentially also healed. And I think that nothing is more powerful than that because at her age to be able to look back through these mm. dreadful memories and what she went through, you helped heal a part of her. And I, I don't think that's replaceable in any way in, in, a, in a fictional story, at least. We're, we're heading into April 25th, the Oscars around the corner. Um, I know that you put this vision out as something that was dear to you, but what was that feeling like when you found out that you both were awesome? You know, the film was uh, received an Oscar nomination. We were both sitting where we're sitting right now. I was right here in the seat, and, and at least was there. We watched it with Colette. We wondered if we should do that or not. I don't know. We were just like, oh, should should we? But we just decided, okay, we'll do it. And and we watched it, and because it's in, it was listed in alphabetical order. There was a lot of excitement. We we weren't aware of who the other nominees were because we were sort of just like, you know, sort of stunned, you know, in a way. And Colette was very stoic, as you can imagine. But she said something very important. And I couldn't have said it any better. I don't think any of us could because, you know, she is a wordsmith, right? She can certainly turn a phrase. And she said that she was very pleased with everybody's work on this and that we, you know, reached this achievement. Um, and because of that achievement, she felt that Jean-Pierre uh, was no longer lost in the night and fog of Dora, is what she said. And I don't know how, what else to say beyond that. It was a great honor, and, and she felt that um, it sort of helped rescue him from that. Well, I think that's a lovely, yeah. lovely thought. You know, yeah. because one of the things that is so tough about the piece, honestly, is to realize that someone with uh, that much promise, you did a wonderful job of bringing out with Lucy and others, the story, his story and the story of people at that time. And it's a big moment to realize that, that for an audience to realize it's not just a history book thing, but this is a guy who had who had a real life and a lot of promise and was a kid, really. Yeah, yeah I yeah. mean, you talk about Jean-Pierre and, and indeed this is re really true. And I, I would uh, so go back to Colette to say that on this day of the nomination, Colette, as Anthony said, was stoic and she was an example to us all. Like we are a young team mm. uh, compared to Colette and she's, she's, been, she's been inspiring 
from the very beginning mm. until now as a strong character who knows her ground, who knows the value of things and who's uh, uh, inspiring for, for women, but also for everybody uh, in, uh, in the team as, uh, as a strong character. Mm. And we, we believe that this it, yeah. it's, uh, it shows uh, to, to people uh, who, who watch the film. Absolutely. As we start to wrap up here, I would just love to also know, you know, um, Shorts TV just released our Oscars special that we do all throughout the country. And so this film is being seen on the big screen. What does that mean to both of you? Hey, hey I, the other day, my, my son, I was taking my son to a dentist appointment and we drove by the IFC Center. Right. And um, on, on, on the way there in, in Manhattan. And I was like, hey, I was like, Colette, it's actually pay playing in that. And he's like, what? It's in a movie theater? I was like, yeah, <laughs> isn't that amazing? I just always remember walking by the IFC Center there and seeing, you know, all the short, you know what I mean? Check out the short uh, films that have been nominated. So it's, yeah, it's it's pretty, it's pretty cool. It's, it's great. I, I, of course, like everyone, wish we were in a different moment in the world where we could actually be going into the theaters um, and packing the theaters to see them. It's wonderful. It's really great. It's all the more moving for us that we are living in this crazy time where we're missing theaters, we're missing cinema, we're missing big movies on screen. Mm. And uh, when the, finally sometimes there's a possibility to, to enjoy this, uh, this shared moment, when you go to a cinema, to a theater, you share the experience with others. Yeah, and so it's not only a big screen with a big uh, audio, like a surrounding audio. It's also a shared experience, and this is uh, why we make film. I mean, it's to share what we feel with the rest of the world. So we need movie theaters. Well, we we are both thrilled for you, and thank you for your time today, and and for creating this beautiful film and preserving history. I think it's um, I don't know. I just I feel. Again, the generation of taking Lucy with Colette, it is so key. And I hope that we as humanity continue to share these stories. They're we important. Do too. Thank you. Important. So thank, thank you, you Russia. Yeah. Thank you, Carter. Thank you. What an amazing team that worked on this short. You know, what really caught my attention was the part about making a nest, creating this safe space for Colette and Lucy. I think a lot of aspiring documentary filmmakers could learn from seeing this short. That's a great note. You bet. And if if you do go and see Colette, you should definitely see it in Anthony's local cinema in New York City, the IFC Center. Rush, you might not know this, being from LA, but the <laughs> IFC Center in New York is really a second home of the Oscar-nominated short films. They always host our premiere, and I was fortunate enough to catch up with the general manager of the IFC Center, John Vanko. John, it's great to have you, and uh, and especially because the IFC Center in New York is where we open the Oscar shorts every year. I think, uh, John, that the, the IFC Center is the only uh, theater in downtown Manhattan that actually shows the Oscar shorts every year. Tell us a little bit about the IFC Center. It's a historic theater. It's in a cool place. You guys show some amazing art house programs. Yeah, um, we're in an old building uh, in the West Village that was built as a church around 1850, and it was uh, converted into a neighborhood movie theater, the Waverly, in 1937. And then we took it over and rebuilt it and combined it with the building next door back in 2005. You know, we're, we're speaking at the just before the Oscar shorts open here, and so we've, we've just reopened after 51 weeks of being closed because of the pandemic. Uh, we're, we're still getting our sea legs under us. And uh, we had a, a strange short notice dynamic with the state of New York where they they gave us 10 days notice before March 5th when we were allowed to reopen. And so it was uh, all the theaters were scrambling to try to get open quickly. You know, the one thing I, I felt really uh, glad about with that short notice that, that it was during Oscar season. And, and there's lots of things about running a movie theater in New York during Oscar season that a lot of things that are possible then that aren't possible the rest of the year. And, you know, having the Oscar shorts, you know, a month after our reopening is been really fortuitous. 
Great. That is fantastic. And you know, I, I have to say it's, it's not a one-sided love affair. It's a, we love coming there and it's primarily because you guys have such amazing audiences. I've never been any place where people line up on the street to wait to get tickets. And I'm sure it's, it's because the IFC center just has that reputation as the place to go for, for the Oscar shorts. One of the other things that's interesting is, that you guys do is you do interviews with uh, filmmakers. You let them introduce the, the films. Tell us about, about what that's like. Yeah, you know, that's, that is a, uh, you know, there are a lot of advantages, again, of, of being a, a neighborhood art house movie theater in New York. A lot of things that we can do that theaters uh, in, in other parts of the country um, can't get away with. Um, you know, we're lucky enough to have filmmakers um, for a lot of the movies that we play, a lot of the kind of hot movies of the season that are, are based in New York. And so our audiences have come to expect that we will, um, as often as not, pull in uh, the, the filmmaker or cast uh, to be there for opening weekend Q&As. You know, it's been a weird year for all of us in this past year where we've seen all sorts of famous people uh, on Zoom from their homes and so forth. And and I'm looking forward to having those cultural heroes back on stage uh, at places like IFC Center. Well, that is uh, great. You know, I one of the things that is fantastic about the IFC Center, honestly, is that you guys have created this feeling of being every New Yorker's hometown theater. Even though New York is a city full of millions of people, everybody feels like they must know each other. I, I'm sure as a theater manager, that's one of the special parts of, of doing this. Yeah. And I, and I think that it's, um, it's really special for the, uh, for the, for the Oscar shorts, because, you know, sometimes there are established, uh, you know, kind of feature directors who, who, who do a short film that gets recognized, but usually these are younger filmmakers who, um, who may not have tasted the limelight and may not have had a kind of a, a feature go through national release. And so, uh, and also, you know, frankly, the, the, the opportunity to be recognized for a short film is a rare thing. And so uh, for, for these New York filmmakers who haven't had, you know, a big feature success and, uh, and, and, and are lucky enough to be nominated um, by the Academy and then be able to stand up on stage in front of invariably a sold out audience of a couple hundred people. You know, there are some people who come to IFC Center all the time and they see the new, you know, hot movie from Korea or France or wherever. But then there are some people who only come for the Oscar shorts every year. One of the fun things that that we've done in the past and some theaters have done is uh, let let people vote for their favorite film or vote on who they think is going to win. And so this is a big question. You know, the, the, the U S has several centers of art, right? For sure. New York is one of the leading cultural centers in the country. Los Angeles is another, they're different. Uh, they, they weigh differently. How often do you think New York's sensibilities are correct on picking the winner? That's important to some of our Oscar pool people. So I just want to know, do you guys, do you think the New Yorkers get it right every time? You know, I think in New York, you've got a mix. That I, I would bet on New York because New York doesn't have a monopoly on smart kind of cineast people going to the movies who, who have good taste or think they have good taste or whatever. There are those people all over the place. But, but in, in New York and L.A., you also have Oscar watchers. And so you've got people who are paying attention to the, the, the other contexts of how the, uh, the membership base has changed demographically and kind of um, who has been ex who executive produced that short and is getting, you know, famous friends to host screenings, in-person screenings in L.A. and all that kind of stuff. So I would say in New York and L.A., you have some people who have a little bit of inside information, in addition to also, I'm sure, being confident that they have better taste than your average bear. So I would bet on New York and L.A. audiences to maybe have a little bit better likelihood of picking the winners. Uh, I'll tell you my own personal secret, John. New York has amazing heritage. But I think that they're almost always right mm. on the documentary category. 
the doc seemed to do better, uh, do exceptionally well in theaters. And uh, the New Yorkers are normally seem to be right on the docs almost every time. Well, that 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 would make sense to me in part because, um, you know, that's another thing that IFC Center focuses on is, is documentary. We produce uh, the biggest documentary festival in America, Doc NYC. We play uh, several of the uh, uh, the nominees. A lot of our audience, um, there's a lot of overlap between people who uh, look to us for what we do with picking, you know, we, we pick the, uh, a short list for features and shorts at Doc NYC um, that often uh, overlaps heavily with the Academy's short list. Th- there is a little bit of a, kind of an insider industry um, uh, audience for documentaries um, that gravitates towards IFC Center. So I wouldn't be surprised if, if that factored in a little bit. Fantastic. It's that it's a it could it certainly could be. You guys are it would make a lot of sense, but it's something that we've all noticed that New York definitely is the p- place to pay attention to for picking the docs and, and your in your theater. I, I when are you when are you guys opening? When do the shorts open? On Friday, April 2nd, uh, we'll be opening all three programs and we look forward to playing them for for many weeks in the theater. Uh, as well as uh, online through the virtual cinema program at IFC Center at home. And I would just say, I think it's a great thing that they're going to be on the virtual cinema and the theater. You know, you can't go wrong if you go first to the theater and then rent them on the virtual cinema to look at them again. Uh, There are a couple of animations, I will tell you, that you will feel like you need to watch at least one more time after you see them in the theater. They're just quite, quite interesting. Uh, they're riveting, but you can't get the story in the first city. That sounds like a terrific recommendation to me. <laughs> Rasha, don't you love New York City? Oh, Carter, I absolutely do. You know the energy, especially when you're in Times Square? There's nothing like it. I just... Oh, I feel so excited and energized when I'm there. But now I have another excuse to go. I definitely want to check out Doc NYC. And for sure next year, I would love to see the filmmakers speak at the IFC Center about their Oscar-nominated short films. Well, I would love to have you because, you know, every year, that's just one of the really special things. When you see them there and, you know, it's very New York and the New Yorkers are asking questions about their film and why did you do that way and... I think it should be a little longer, or you could have cut out that first <laughs> scene. It's just great. I bet. I, and if you're a New Yorker and you're listening now, and you haven't already seen the Oscar shorts, go get your ticket and see them at the IFC Center. And if you haven't already, don't forget to subscribe to this podcast to find out where you can see the Oscar shorts near you and hear from all the filmmakers. So that's ciao for now. <laughs> See you next time. <laughs>